and welcome to the uh, May, Monday, May 4th, 2020 uh, County Council meeting. Uh, we have one item on the agenda, but a long item, might we add. It's a, uh, a, a work session on the Montgomery County Public Schools FY21 through 26 Capital Improvements Program. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Council Member Rice, please. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I really want to thank uh, you and all of my colleagues for uh, their deferring this until today. It gave a lot of opportunity for a lot of folks to be able to see uh, uh, the packet in greater detail. Also, I really want to thank Mr. Levchenko, who took time out of his busy weekend of other packets that he had to prepare and uh, uh, capital uh, improvement uh, program uh, budget work. Uh, to be able to come up with a, a even more detailed synopsis of some of the salient decision points. All of you should have received that, and so I really want to thank him for that as well. Uh, on the uh, conference Zoom with us today, we have uh, Shebra Evans, who's the chair of our, uh, or the president of our Board of Education. Uh, we've got Dr. Jack Smith, who's our superintendent of Montgomery County Public Schools, uh, Essie McGuire, who all of us know uh, very well. She's our uh, uh, is the MCPS uh, Superintendent of Operations. Uh, Seth Adams, who's our Director of our Facilities Management for Montgomery County Public Schools. Adrian Karamias, uh, who's the Director of the Division of Capital Planning. Uh, of course, we've got Mary Beck from OMB and Veronica Joao from uh, OMB as well. So I really want to thank all of them uh, for being on the call. Uh, of course, I want to thank uh, uh, Mr. Craig Howard as well, who always works ably with uh, Mr. Levchenko and a lot of different issues, uh, but clearly Mr. Levchenko has outdone himself with a 157-page packet uh, that details uh, all of the great uh, things that are going on in terms of continuing to advance Montgomery County Public Schools to be one of the best school systems in the nation. Uh, I oftentimes get criticized when I say that, uh, but I truly do believe it, having two children in the system. Uh, and seeing the great work that's being done as so many other systems around us continue to struggle uh, with completing uh, distance learning and really creating a model uh, to see Montgomery County Public Schools do what they have been deserves uh, recognition. And so I just really want to thank uh, from the top down, Dr. Smith, and certainly have been out there with your uh, folks that are on the front lines handing out food, uh, talking with teachers who are continuing to create great lesson plans, and everybody all around. Uh, they just do a great job. I also want to thank my colleagues on the uh, Education and Culture Committee, uh, Councilmember Navarro and Councilmember Jawando, for all of their thoughtful work as it comes to really crafting uh, the best budget we can to support our Montgomery County Public Schools and continue the great work that's being done there. Uh, now, of course, uh, does that mean that everybody always has the best experience? Uh, and has the best results? Of course not. Uh, and certainly part of this capital improvements program budget deals specifically with that. Uh, we know that the environment that our children go in helps to shape the education that they receive. Uh, if they're going into a place that's dark and dank and musty, uh, may have mold, other kinds of challenges uh, that folks can't address um, or continue to have to remediate, that's gonna make it more challenging for our children. Uh, and it's not to take anything away from our building maintenance workers and everyone else who mm -hmm. continues to do what they need to to try and hold some of our schools together. But the reality is there's only so much you can do at some point and really do have to make sure uh, that then, you know, the, the life expectancy of these buildings is respected uh, in that sense. And, you know, we don't try and extend things beyond their capacity because we know what that needs in terms of the learning environment for our kids. We also are challenged in a lot of areas to where we continue to see growth. Uh, we have lots of growth that continues throughout the county in certain areas. And we know that because of that, that means compression. Uh, that means that some of our schools become overcrowded. Uh, some of our schools uh, then are uh, bursting at the seams. And so that also uh, affects uh, the impact on our children. When we have schools that are overcrowded and multiple lunch periods that have to start at you know, as early as 1030 in the morning and go as late as 130 in the afternoon, well, that's a part of our capacity issues as well. And so when we try and address these, we do understand that there are a myriad of issues that we're trying to deal with uh, when trying to make these things happen. And so it's a very complicated system, as I know each of my colleagues certainly understand. 
There are a lot of priorities, all of which are incredibly important for our community as a whole, but also uh, leave us challenged because how do we prioritize one over the other? How do we pick and choose between a person who's dealing with a dilapidated, a dilapidated building and a person who's dealing with uh, severe overcrowding in their schools, both of which are incredibly and equally important. Uh, and which one do we do first? Because we know, unfortunately, even with the state's infusion of cash, we still don't have enough money to do all of the projects that we need to. And it has been that way for decades. Uh, this isn't anything new. And uh, it's really a case where Montgomery County has continued to always step up and do more. Uh, we continue to put forth our money, our taxpayer dollars. Uh, so I wanna thank each and every one of our constituents uh, who understand what the responsibility is for Montgomery County and also respect the fact that we are trying to make this a better community by investing in education for our kids. We know that that means that we have better attraction for companies. We know that it means a better economic system. It means lower crime. It means better healthcare outcomes. All kinds of things are directly tied to education. And so when we create a system that stood up, we get all of those things as benefits. So I wanted to start there, Mr. Uh, President, because um, this is incredibly challenging. Uh, it's quite expensive uh, and uh, it's gonna be difficult for us to pick and choose priorities. But at the end of the day, we know the reason why we do it. And that's what I wanted to highlight here because it has such profound impacts, even in the case of COVID-19, uh, in which we can see some of the groundwork that we've laid that's helped us out when it comes to technology uh, and our tech mod budgets each, each year. And I wanna thank my uh, colleagues on the uh, Education and Culture Committee, but then all of you uh, who continue to vote and support us beefing up tech mod, because now guess what? We have a structure that can actually handle uh, this pandemic in terms of uh, us having what we need. We purchased Chromebooks and other kinds of things in advance and did all of these things. And you guys each raised your hands and voted yes to make those things happen. And as a result, we have successes when it comes to uh, education in the face of COVID-19. That's something that we should all be proud of uh, and certainly something that ties in to this budget and will tie into budgets in the future. So with that, Mr. President, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Smith and uh, Ms. Evans. I think I'll let uh, Ms. Evans, the president of our Board of Education, certainly go first in terms of uh, any comments that she has, turn it over to Dr. Smith, and then uh, turn to my colleagues on uh, the committee if they had any opening remarks, and then we can go into Mr. Levchenko going through the budget. Okay. Ms. Evans, the floor is yours. Okay, good morning. I'm having, um, hopefully I won't have any computer difficulties. I got kicked out of Zoom just for a minute there, but just want to say um, thank you to our council president Katz and to all the members of the Montgomery County Council for having us here today. As stated, I'm Shepherd Evans, the president on the Board of Education, and I am here today to speak in support of the Board of Education's requested CIP for fiscal year 2021 and for fiscal year 2021 through 2026, our capital improvements program. Um, I did wanna start by taking the opportunity to thank you all for your leadership and our county executive also during these unprecedented times uh, when the board was back that we could have predicted. Can you hear me? Now I can, but you wouldn't, couldn't for a minute. Okay, I'll take off my headphones. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, we had no idea of knowing at that time that we would be faced as a county um, and state and country with the current crisis. So I just wanted to say that there's so many different issues that are pressing and we appreciate you allowing us to come here today to talk about the CIP request. Um, this increase is to provide additional capacity at many of our schools throughout the system to upgrade and replace many of our building systems and to meet the rising construction costs compared to the approved CIP. Um, in total, the requested CIP includes funding for 25 capital um, capacity projects to address space deficits system-wide. Um, at the elementary school level, I just want to discuss that there are six previously approved addition projects, two previously approved new schools, 
three new addition projects, expenditures in the out years of the CIP for a new elementary school and previously approved planning funds for three addition projects with completion dates to be determined in the um, future CIP. At the middle school level, we have four previously approved addition projects and one previously approved replacement project. At the high school level, two previously approved addition projects, one previously approved addition facility upgrade, the opening of a new high school and the reopening of a former high school. The 25 capacity projects do not include funding for the nine major capital projects that are requested to address both aging infrastructure and capacity issues. Those projects are Burnt Mills, South Lake, Stonegate, Woodland Elementary Schools, Nielsville Middle School, Poolsville, Damascus, Wooten, and Magruder High Schools. The board CIP requests also request funding for an early childhood center at Watkins Mill um, High School to provide opportunities to students to develop their um, readiness skills for school. With respect to the countywide projects, the board's requests will address system needs by increasing systemic projects such as roof replacement and plan life cycle asset replacement. The board did approve a substantial increase in heating, ventilation, and air conditioning replacement projects, and that was to address the backlog of upgrades and replacements of our HVAC systems that are beyond their expected service life. Um, during our deliberation on the FY 2021 through 2026 CIP, the Board of Education sought to balance the fiscal difficulties at the same time, you know, that's facing the county with the needs that um, will address our overcrowded and aging school infrastructures. While we certainly understand that since November, our fiscal climate has been significantly impacted as a result of COVID-19 pandemic, we still believe that the CIP requests a responsible six-year spending plan that aims to provide our students with programmatic and educational spaces that they need to learn. So I just wanted to say thank you again for just allowing us to come and have a, you know open discussion with the community to um, hear that as well about our um, needs here in Montgomery County. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith? Yes, thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you, Ms. Evans, for outlining uh, the current circumstances in Montgomery County Public Schools. And I also, um, I also uh, want to uh, thank uh, Council President Katz, uh, Chair of the Education Culture Committee, Council Member Rice, and, and all the council members for your ongoing and long time vision for public education in the school system, as well as the county executive and his work in supporting the school. Um, I am very fortunate to work in a place where people believe in and support public education for all children. We're in a tough time. That's a statement of the obvious. And there are a lot of challenges and there's a lot of uncertainty. We, there are many, many questions we cannot answer right now. In fact, many more that we can't answer than we can. What we do know is we want to go back to school at some point and the constraints under which we go back uh, are becoming more clear, but we still don't know what they will be. We know, for example, that Maryland has not closed all of its schools uh, for the rest of this school year, but that seems more and more likely, and I expect an announcement by the end of this week or early next week, given that right now we're scheduled to reopen schools on May 18th. We, it's pretty likely that's not going to happen. The larger question is what are we going to do when we get to uh, June 15th and our last day of school and what will this summer and next year look like. And the fact is that there are likely to be constraints and there are likely to be ways of working that we've never done before and ways of experiencing school that we've never had before. We may well need more space, not less, because of social distancing on buses, in classrooms, cafeterias, all of those things. So as we think about this new normal and as it unfolds in what feels like very, very slow steps, small steps that are difficult to deal with uh, intellectually and psychologically, we have to stay very nimble. But we know that space is likely to be at a premium. We also know that it's required the Board of Education, the State Board of Education, 
the federal government to change policy, suspend policy, adjust policy. We've got to be thinking that way as a school system and as a community and a state. How do we manage all of our regulations, our requirements, everything around school buildings going forward to make sure that we have the best possible circumstance for our students? As you all know, we had a 2,587 student increase this year. We are continuing to grow. And through the good work of MCPS staff members, uh, we quickly developed a registration and enrollment system that's all online and through the mail. And we are registering pre-K, we are registering kindergartners, and we are registering new students in our school right now as we speak. And so I wanna give a shout out to those folks. We also know we've gained about 25,000 students in a little over a decade in this school system. On February 7th, the Board of Education received a request for a list of non-recommended reductions, and we completed that uh, list. And while it's difficult, um, it certainly is understandable given the circumstance we're in right now. We'd be having a different conversation if we were not in this circumstance about our needs. We do also know that the disparity in the expenditures over the first four years equates to $300 million. And that's difficult uh, because um, there are a lot of big projects in there. And I'm gonna talk about some of those big projects in just a minute. Uh, those big projects are there because they've been marching through the system for the last uh, five and six and eight and 10 years. And unfortunately, uh, just 10 years ago, we were dealing with a similar economic circumstance in our state and nation. And uh, many say this one will be even more difficult, but that $300 million was not front loaded because we wanted to spend all the money quickly or first, it was just the sequence of these projects. And so when you look at that non-recommended reduction scenario, it asked for a one-year delay in the following capacity projects with planning funds maintained. Clarksburg Cluster Elementary School number nine, we have a school in Clarksburg that is almost at double its capacity. Defeef Elementary School addition facility upgrade to relieve Rachel Carson Elementary, which is tremendously over-enrolled. William Tyler Page Elementary School addition also heavily over-enrolled. A new high school at Crown where we have available land that is dedicated to a school uh, and it's available for the next several years, but not forever. And then finally, Northwood High School and Charles Woodward High School. I say those in the same breath because remember they are linked together. We would create a Woodward so that we could begin, or at least a first phase of Woodward so we could immediately then begin creating a, a new Northwood uh, facility upgrade there. So Northwood students could stay in the Woodward facility while that school's being done. And remember last uh, year and a half, two years ago, we did an extensive review of the properties in the county, worked with the planning board, worked with the, the governmental offices to identify where could we have a holding school for the Northwood population during the, the renovation of that school. And at the end of the day, by far the most efficient by cost is in the new Woodward phase one high school. And so those are tied right together. Also a one year delay in the in the Colonel Zadok Magruder High School major capital project, a two year delay in the Bethesda Elementary School addition project, removal of all expenditures for the following projects in the six year IC, an addition at Westbrook Elementary, we're still going to be able to move some students to Westbrook without that addition, and the early childhood center that we very much wanted to put at Watkins Mill High School to continue to serve our growing pre-K and very necessary expanding pre-K program. Also, we will not uh, go forward with the Shell classroom build out at Maryvale at this time, the Maryvale Carl Sandberg Learning Center, which will, the new facility will open up this uh, August and the expenditure reductions in 23 and 24 for heating, ventilation and air conditioning projects. So all of these non-recommended reductions have an incredibly uh, significant impact on our school system and our community, but we also understand the current economic circumstance we're in has an incredibly significant impact on everything to do with our lives and how everything fits together. Uh, we have asked for $110.4 million from the state. Uh, it's based on the current eligibility of projects approved by the County Council. 
We will uh, continue to know more about that state funding. In the last uh, couple of years, it's been in the 50 to $60 million range. And we also have the Built to Learn Act of 2020 up in the air right now. So as I said early in my remarks, there are a lot more questions than there are answers. And we just want to stay nimble and flexible. We wanna realize when things are connected, we wanna change our rules and regulations and the way we do things to fit the context. And we wanna work with the county council and the county executive's office to really do the very best we can for the school students and families of Montgomery County Public Schools. So thank you for this opportunity. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Smith and Mr. President. Um, because the Education and Culture Committee did not get a chance to meet on this, I do want to give my uh, colleagues on the committee just an opportunity if they wanted to make any brief remarks, and then we'll turn right to Mr. Levchenko to get us into budget deliberation. So, Councilmember Navarro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Council Presidents. Good to see you, Dr. Smith and Ms. Shebra Evans. Um, really want to thank you on behalf of all the parents uh, and everybody here in Montgomery County for the amazing job that everybody is doing. The uh, MCPS staff, teachers are just amazing. Um, these are such extraordinary times. And once again, I think everybody has stepped up in a significant way. Uh, and so for that, I just wanna express my appreciation. I um, understand, of course, that this is a very comprehensive packet. I wanna thank our staff, uh, Mr. Lechenko for putting this together. Um, and I also understand that the non-recommended uh, reductions uh, offered by the school board are in response to those recommended reductions by the county executive. Um, I know that the staff, and we're gonna go through the packet, has made some recommendations about um, what we should restore. And, um, and so we will be uh, talking about all of those. Um, I did want to just briefly mention um, my uh, interest in uh, exam re-examining specifically, uh, for example, Magruder High School, um, because I, we do also know that there is additional state aid that um, everybody's gonna take a look at and see what the implications are of that. Um, we also know that there was a, um, a uh, calculation of a projection of what we might expect from the state, a state aid that was reduced by the executive. Um, but then when I look at Magruder High School and what uh, I just heard Dr. Smith talk about in terms of this you know, new normal or abnormal, if you will, and how important it is to look at systems upgrade when we are not undertaking a major, major renovation, um, but you know, we know the systems are important. Um, I have to say that we do need to talk about those kind of issues when it comes to Magruder High School, a school that was built in 1970. Um, it has approximately 40% Latino students, 18% African-American, 12.4% Asian. Um, it is so important for us to put all of this in perspective. Uh, and we, we look at the, uh, the uh, this particular project that is within the ma major capital projects, it also has the third highest utilization rate. So I think all of those elements are elements that I hope as we engage in this conversation today that we can consider um, because there seems to be some um, hope in terms of the state aid that was approved for $120 million over 10 years. Um, and I think, again, when we look at these kinds of situations where you have a high school um, with uh, such a high uh, rate, uh, utilization rate um, that needs these systems upgrade, et cetera, it will be important. Of course, I also wanna have a conversation about the early uh, childhood um, center and see you know, what are some options and alternatives there as well, because this is so, of course, critical. Um, but you know, as it was stated, uh, by everyone that has spoken so far, these are difficult decisions. I, I do understand that, and I do understand we're in uncertain times. Um, but then again, I think that you know the recommendations made by our staff are solid recommendations for restoration. I I support the, support those, um, but I think that we have some room to perhaps accommodate some um, some other projects that, in the long run, I think it would cost us more if we keep delaying. Thank you so much, Councilmember Jawando. Thank you, uh, Chairman Rice, and to uh, Dr. Smith and Ms. Evans. Thank you all for your dedication to all of our students uh, and their families. Uh, this is obviously, if you never thought that families were involved in education, which I know you all did, we are seeing that. Uh, I just saw it this morning at 8 a.m., as did 
uh, you know, tens of thousands of other parents uh, and, and colleagues on the council here. Uh, we're all in this together, and, and you, the work that you guys are doing is uh, incredible, uh, and I appreciate it. Um, I'm so glad you led with what you did, Dr. Smith, as far as underscoring uh, how we return back to school uh, in in some semblance of a fashion that we, we're used to. And I think about that every day, uh, as do many of us, of not only how we return and how do we keep people safe as we return uh, in the size and space and and, and what buildings we have available, all that factors in, as you mentioned, but also uh, what are our students, how do we make sure that our students that are the furthest behind that may not have access and not be logging in to their classes uh, or are doing so infrequently, how do we make sure they have what they need uh, to catch up and to be on track? And so we, we've got, and I know we'll talk more about that in the operating budget context too, but the CIP plays a role in the technology uh, infrastructure plays a role. This, they're all connected. Um, and so I would ag uh, agree with uh, my colleagues on the education committee. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Lachenko and, and our staff has put together a robust and comprehensive packet. I also concur with the recommendations to for things to restore on the non-recommended list and also think that we need to look at some other things. Uh, in addition to uh, the early learning center uh, I think there's a few other projects we might want to take a look at, and I know we'll have that discussion here. Uh, but I've said from the beginning, as we started our operating budget discussion, as we've continued the CIP, uh, we have to be thinking at the forefront of our mind, how do we maximize and give ourselves the best opportunity for success, our students, and realize that uh, we're going to have to make some difficult choices, but there is no better investment than in our students, in our future, and making sure that they can be competitive and that the school system stays one of the best in the nation, as Councilmember Rice said. So uh, I know we're all eager to get into this conversation. I want to thank you all again and uh, look forward to having this discussion. Well, thank you very much to Councilmember Navarro and Councilmember Juwando. I'm going to turn to Mr. Lepchenko. I would just ask, Mr. President, as far as how I think it would be best for us to do this, what I'd like to see is to have Mr. Lepchenko walk through the packet in an overview first then if we could address each item separately um, would be the best way to go about it. I know that council staff actually came up with a lump of uh, a, a couple different projects that he recommended restoration of, but I think that uh, because we haven't had a chance to talk about this either committee-wise nor as a full council, we need to address each one of those items individually. And then at the end, if there are other things that folks would like to have restored, then they should then bring those up at the end of the council staff recommendations. Uh, because of course, obviously we'll do CIP reconciliation anyway at another time. So this is just putting things on a reconciliation list to then be decided uh, later on. So that would be my proposal to you, Mr. President, if that is okay with you, sir. I think that uh, makes a lot of sense. And I think we should begin, please. Mr. Levchenko, it's yours. Great. Um uh, first, I'm going to refer folks to the cover sheet of the memo. I'm going to touch on a few of the items in there. Uh, we already heard actually a lot of it from uh, our previous speakers, so I'm not going to dwell on some of those points. But some of the key issues, um, the fiscal summary really does lay out the trying to fit 15 pounds in a 10 pound bag problem that we have. Um, we have uh, the schools requested about $1.8 billion. Uh, the executive's recommendation uh, is actually slightly below the amended CIP and well below uh, the agency request. Uh, and as uh, Dr. Smith mentioned, uh, the years are also quite significant because uh, the school's request has significantly more dollars in the first four years uh, than the executive's um, uh, total numbers do for MCPS. And, and I do want to emphasize that the executive's numbers are basically an affordability uh, string. Uh, he does not make specific recommendations or has not made specific recommendations, except in a few cases. And that's why, as Dr. Smith mentioned, uh, uh, they responded to uh, Council Member Wright or Council Chair Rice, Rice's um, uh, letter to uh, provide more specificity as to how one could get to the executive's numbers. And the executive's numbers are important because they do tie to the council spending affordability. 
uh, and ultimately that's what we have to tie to as part of reconciliation. So it gives us a target. Obviously, there's lots of moving parts uh, from January 15th on that we have to take into account, but uh, it gives you a rough uh, sense or lay of the land going forward. Um, so uh, the, the fiscal summary there is something I did want to remind folks of. Um, also, just continuing down the cover sheet, uh, we've had a number of, uh, the, the committee did get to meet once um, before uh, the pandemic uh, closed our facilities and, and ended our committee sessions uh, and did go over some of the more technical projects. Uh, and those are listed in the packet. I'm not going to go through those details, uh, but the, council, the, the committee was able to make some progress on those. Um, the council also did approve MCPS's relocatable classrooms supplemental and amendment. Uh, so to the degree that can move forward this summer and uh, like everything else, it's uncertain, but at least they have the resources they need um, to contract, to do that contracting work as they normally would in a regular year. Um, uh, so I just, I did want to emphasize that we've had, we have made some progress on the CIP uh, since January 15th. Uh, however, as uh, committee chair Rice mentioned, there's a lot more work to do. Uh, I also did want to touch upon the state aid issue, which was uh, discussed. Uh, some folks have brought that up. Uh, the FY21 state aid uh, is pretty certain at this point, and we're uh, a few million dollars below what had been um, programmed in the CIP. Uh, so we do have a bit of a gap in FY21 to deal with, uh, and it, it's about $4.6 million gap, so we will have to deal with that. Uh, I think less certain is FY22 through FY26. And as you heard, we do have the, obviously we have the regular state school construction money that uh, we would request every year, but we also do have the Built to Learn Act dollars, which um, were, are intended to provide a substantial amount of money to the county uh, over the next 10 years. Um, however, there's a lot of uncertainty with regard to that. In addition to just the the, the COVID-19 issue and whether that creates um, any delays in the, um, uh, uh, whether the, the state delays its, its um, bonding issues with this, uh, or if casino revenue, which is a significant uh, um, revenue source for this, what happens there, we don't know. So we can't control that. But apart from that, we still also have to work within the uh, eligibility guidelines that the state has provided us and the local match requirement. And that's a significant issue. We don't want to overprogram state aid without having a sufficient local match assumed in our CIP. We don't want to set ourselves up uh, for a problem later. So um, MCPS, OMB staff and, and council staff have done a lot of work uh, looking at this issue. and. Um, as staff, I'm, I'm feeling pretty close to what I am going to um, be putting forth to the council as part of our uh, status update later this week on the CIP. Not quite there yet, but uh, we will have some state aid numbers to show you on Thursday. Um, but a couple elements within that. Um, uh, per state law, MCPS uh, is uh, limited in what it can um, receive per project. Uh, depending on whether it bids its projects uh, with, with prevailing wage provisions or not. Um, currently, because we have um, an overwhelming number of projects uh, and the way the state aid has been allocated in recent years, plenty of eligibility, uh, MCPS has uh, pursued trying to maximize its state aid while minimizing its match, and that makes perfect fiscal sense. Um, but the result of that has been that we are limited in our projects to receiving less than 25% um, of, of state aid per project. However, going forward with the substantial additional amount of state aid being made available, uh, we are going to have to increase that, that uh, state aid ratio that we get per project in order to make the numbers work. Uh, so one element within the CIP going forward is we will need MCPS uh, to assume prevailing wage going forward with its projects um, in the CIP in order to increase that 25 or less than 25 percent um, uh, allocation from the state per project to something significantly higher. And we're hoping 
35, 40%, something like that. Uh, that additional state aid will offset uh, the prevailing wage increases that we may incur from, from that change. Uh, it's difficult to predict what the uh, prevailing wage impacts are on any particular project. MCPS can speak to that today. Uh, the numbers they told me would be uh, useful for programming purposes uh, would be basically about a 10% increase in projects. And then we would assume, obviously, more state aid in those years to offset that and, and hopefully create some additional room. But that's sort of one element of this is we would need to go back to those projects and uh, make sure we fund them appropriately so that we feel comfortable we can move forward with that. Um, the other element is uh, there's a lot of uh, eligibility issues that um, we've identified that we would like to work with the state on uh, to revise in order to uh, avail us of more eligibility and ultimately more state aid um, under the current system. Uh, so regardless of how much money there is, we feel there can be some improvements to how they um, uh, review our projects and determine what's eligible and what's not. And that's going to be an ongoing uh, issue going forward. And it's going to take a lot of time to, to uh, make progress there, but it's well worth it and can help us secure uh, more state aid in the long run. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll stop if there's any questions about state aid. Um, like I said, I don't have numbers today, but uh, I will be presenting some assumptions Thursday as part of the CIP status update. Thank you very much. Council Member Friedson. Thank you, uh, Council President. Thank you to uh, Council Member Rice and the Education and Culture Committee for uh, your work on this. Thank you to the school system for uh, all of the efforts that you're doing. There's no doubt this is difficult when the uh, proposed budget before us has $302.8 million in cuts in the near years when we need the money the most, uh, when it actually is real in terms of what we can move forward on and what we can't. Uh, that's serious, and that puts us in a very difficult uh, position, and we're working through it as best as we can, and I really appreciate Mr. Levchenko's detailed analysis and, and hard work here, uh, taking uh, the, the mantle from, from Dr. Orlin and, 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 and building upon it, and uh, you know, really appreciate Dr. Orlin as well, who I know has been uh, helping uh, and behind the scenes providing advice to me and others, uh, as well as uh, Mr. Levchenko. Uh, two big things that I wanted to focus on and I know are front and, and center on, in everybody's mind. One is moratorium and two is overcapacity and uh, school overcrowding uh, issues. I don't think there are any two uh, issues when it comes to our school's CIP that are more important than those two uh, in the context of it. The moratorium issue uh, specifically related to the staff recommendations, which I strongly appreciate and hope that we can uh, figure out a way to uh, move forward with, uh, particularly with regards to Woodward uh, and Northwood. Uh, I think it's important to note that the Woodward aspect of that uh, is uh, both a moratorium issue and an overcrowding issue. It's not just for WJ, which is uh, projected to go upwards of 900 students over capacity without this uh, project moving forward on time, but also has implications to the entire Down County Consortium. And so. Uh, it's a Northwood WJ Down County Consortium issue, which really impacts a huge swath uh, of the county in terms of capacity, uh, but also on the moratorium issue. We need uh, to get out of this crisis and have a healthy and thriving economy so that we can fund the schools uh, that uh, we all hold so dear and so that we can pay for uh, the services that we all uh, know that our residents are relying on and provide the world class education that. Montgomery County is known for. And so I hope that we can uh, move forward in particular uh, with that. I would also note that uh, as was uh, mentioned uh, earlier briefly, uh, Woodward has already been delayed. The community has already had to sustain a delay as a result of uh, the uh, lack of understanding of where the Northwood students would go during the renovation for that project. Uh, that was uh, a very difficult pill to swallow for a community that's already been waiting a very long time. And so hopefully we are not gonna add uh, further delays to the delay that has already uh, occurred uh, there. And then uh, additionally, I just wanted to raise Bethesda Elementary School, very important project 
Uh, Bethesda obviously has seen a tremendous amount of growth, not just in the new buildings that are being built as part of the downtown Bethesda plan, but in a significant amount of neighborhood turnover as uh, older residents who moved in post World War II and, and beyond are uh, starting to move out and new young families are starting to move in. That's a real positive for uh, our community, but it has implications to our schools. Uh, Bethesda Elementary School is currently 100, uh, projected to be 171 students uh, over capacity. Uh, and if we don't fund it uh, soon, and if we accept the two year uh, delay as is currently uh, recommended, uh, we risk a moratorium there as well, and one of our most important economic engines uh, in the county. And so I, I understand there's one particular elementary school that the chair is particularly interested in, which I'm very sympathetic uh, towards given the uh, level of overcrowding at that school, which is staggering. Uh, and I don't uh, discount that, but I just wanted to include in that conversation uh, the uh, need uh, as well for Bethesda Elementary School and make a strong uh, pitch that uh, this is a uh, significant overcrowding issue uh, as well and has significant uh, economic development uh, issues as well down the road. And I would hate for us to set the stage in this budget for a future problem that could uh, uh, impact the economic development of one of the most important uh, business areas uh, and economic development areas and revenue areas uh, of the county in downtown uh, Bethesda. So I appreciate the deliberative work. Hope we can focus on making sure that we keep uh, all of our uh, clusters out of moratorium so that we can get out of this challenge uh, as well as we can economically to fund the schools uh, that, that, that need that support and also that we can address the overcrowding challenges throughout the county and especially at uh, Bethesda Elementary School. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Council Member. Mr. President. Mr. President, yeah. Mr. Lachenko actually wasn't done. He was just pausing for the state aid. And, and so before we get to uh, uh, folks who may have some particular issues or thoughts, if we could just give the floor back to Mr. Lachenko to finish up in terms of his non-recommended uh, rec re uh, reduction uh, recommendations and go from there, uh, then we can turn it back over to- uh, Thank, thank you very much, Council Member Rice. But I believe Council Member Reamer does have a question on- About state, state aid. aid? Oh, okay, sorry, thank you. That's good. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm trying to just understand how much state aid are we booking? Uh, it's not clear from the cover sheet. I see there's a figure for a 10 year, you know, uh, anticipated allocation from the state, but what are we going with in this capital budget? Do we know? Um, yeah, I had mentioned the, in year one, FY21, we have the 54 million roughly that we're assuming. For FY22 and beyond, uh, I had mentioned I was uh, going to bring that up in the context of the CIP status update at the council on Thursday. So you're still working on it? Is that the still working the on it? Line? Still working on it. What I'm looking at is uh, taking into account what we expect in the regular state aid that we're getting and, and the trends there which unfortunately are down a little bit. Uh, and then the new state aid, looking at how to phase that in appropriately so that we make sure we have sufficient eligibility um, in the first few years and at the end of the six years to, to accommodate the additional aid. But the idea is to show additional state aid in the CIP. Um, I just don't wanna to commit to that this second. Um, but there will be uh, an increased amount to one, uh, cover the prevailing wage change that I mentioned, but also assume a phasing in of that uh, Built to Learn Act money uh, in a reasonable way. Okay, um, thank you, that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, sorry, one more. Are your recommendations anticipating a certain number that you have in mind for revenue uh, or are they not necessarily tightly correlated? I mean, how did you, how, do you, how did you think about recommending what we would add funding for as opposed to what you think we may have revenue to cover? Uh, yeah, I have not done that calculation yet to say absolutely we could fit what I'm recommending yet. Um, what I've tried to do is um, from my perspective on the non-recommended reductions, uh, I felt the uh, Northwood, Woodward, and Crown projects stood out for a number of reasons, uh, some of which you've already heard. Uh, the fact that they're existing projects, uh, they've been studied for many years, delayed in some cases. Um, uh, they have significant um, 
capacity issues that would be addressed and um, moratorium issues if, if delayed. Uh, so all of those factors um, put, helped me put those at the top of the list for restoration. Uh, like I say in the memo though, it's gonna come down to uh, a lot of other moving parts. Uh, I can't commit to say they can fit today, uh, but by putting them in uh, or by assuming that they are in for now, that's the goal is to try to find the room to do that and to move other elements in the CIP to do that. Uh, but I, I don't know what those those uh, other elements are, what the trade-offs might be at this point. Uh, and of course, it's gonna be up to the, to the council and the reconciliation process to decide those ultimate priorities, both within MCPS and beyond, including all of the uh, uh, categories of spending in the CIP. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Beck, please. Mary, you're on mute. Okay, you. thanks. I, I did just want to say uh, this has been extremely difficult to try to estimate state aid. There are so many factors that are at play. The governor has to sign the bill for starters. It has not been signed yet. Uh, even if he signs it, if the state budget is in free fall, as Keith alluded to, they may delay issuance of these bonds. The soonest we could get this money is in 22 under, under good circumstances. And uh, they could also choose to temporarily divert casino proceeds, which have been reduced because of the closures to help with the state operating budget. So we've been trying to really go down a path of um, extreme caution it also really varies by state aid for projects that are very clearly uh, over overpopulated schools, over capacity, and not just in our view, but by the state's definition, we feel we can get the higher state aid, but getting that match percentage up, as Keith said, is absolutely the game changer in this whole thing. It's like the equivalent of a vaccine for COVID. That's, that's what we really have to focus on but it is project specific and some projects just because of the nature of the work will not qualify for those higher percentages. So that's, that's why Keith is hesitating and being cautious on this. And I think it's a wise move. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Levchenko. Okay, um, getting back to the non-recommended reductions. Um, uh, I was going further down in, in the in the council staff packet um, pages or page six is the six is six and seven is a write up on the non recommended reductions. I also did provide an addendum uh, to the council that's at the very end of the packet that gets into the individual projects that show up on the chart on page seven of this of the memo. Uh, so for folks that are that wanted more information about each of these projects, I, I tried to provide that. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, from, staff's, from staff's perspective, um, we, we, we try to defer as much as we can to the school system to come up with these non-recommended reductions uh, to help set the table for the council. Um, but of course, we have to look at these and, and, and establish uh, our priorities. And, and if things can be restored, uh, we do not have a priority list from the schools as to which to be restored first. Uh, so this is up to us to, to weigh in on that. As I mentioned earlier, I felt um, Woodward, Crown, and Northwood rose to the top of my list for a number of reasons, and it's noted in the packet. Um, another element here is um, we have new projects and we have existing projects. For those projects that are newly requested, um, they do not exist yet. So I, I don't wanna call those delays uh, the same way we would call an existing approved project that's funded a delay. Uh, I think it is, uh, I think language does matter there. Uh, and in those cases, if we can fit a, new, a, a newly requested project in the CIP, that's an addition to the CIP. That's not a delay necessarily. Uh, so I, staff looked at that as well. Um, uh, new projects can be fit within the CIP, perhaps not on the schedule the board wants, but at least uh, accommodated in the CIP. I think that's a that's still a positive. Um, for those projects that are in the CIP already and would be delayed, um, we look at, well, where are they going in terms of when would they be completed and what is the delay? 
Uh, and a number of these projects are one year delays and they would still be finishing well before the end of the CIP. Uh, so while not ideal, at least the CIP continues to support them and they do at least move one year down the line and hopefully can be protected in future years to stay on that schedule. Uh, we have had projects that have been delayed multiple times over the years, so we can't guarantee that, uh, but at least we're keeping those projects from, from slipping out of the CIP period. Uh, that's another problem with uh, Woodward and Northwood. If they were delayed at all, they would move out of the six-year CIP period. That's where we get the, uh, the SSP schools test issue coming up. They would no longer, the seats associated with those build-outs would not be available for the, for the schools test and you would have significant moratorium issues. Uh, many of these other projects don't have that same kind of issue because they're still completing within the six-year period. Um, you do have a couple of other newly requested projects that uh, Dr. Smith mentioned that would be removed um, and they would obviously could still be reconsidered in future years or in the case of the early childhood project, uh, I think there's a broader operating discussion that probably needs to happen on that end uh, that uh, committee chair Rice, I think, would be interested in to uh, get a sense of, of that issue more holistically. But uh, uh, so in, in a couple cases in these non-recommended reductions, you have actual uh, newly requested projects that would be removed. But uh, the overwhelming number of these projects here, whether they are newly requested or whether they are uh, ex existing projects, would still be completed within the six-year period. Um, as I mentioned, the exception would be those high school projects, and that's what drew me to those. Um, and as I mentioned to Council Member Reamer, uh, we don't know fully what the, uh, the funding denominator is yet in terms of what can fit, uh, but I think it's very important for the Council today uh, to get a sense of what its priorities are, which can help guide staff uh, during this reconciliation process. Uh, for instance, if, if additional projects here are sought to be uh, kept on schedule, uh, an obvious question is uh, where would those resources come from to do that? And the, the biggest set of projects left um, that are only touched upon in this would be the major capital projects. Uh, those projects had uh, significantly new, newly requested dollars in them uh, in the school's request. Uh, that's where a lot of the driving of this fiscal issue is coming from, that those new dollars. Uh, so if this non-recommended reduction list gets trimmed significantly, uh, the next big source of dollars to look for would be in the major capital projects, whether elementary or, or secondary schools. I do have a write-up on those also in the addendum because the Magruder High School major capital project is on the non-recommended reductions for a deferral, uh, but none of the other projects in, the, in those two projects, none of those other schools in those projects are recommended for deferral. But if we were to significantly increase uh, or, or significantly affect this list, I have no doubt that that's an area we'd have to look at to offset. Um, I think, uh, I don't know if I had any more to add to that. Um, there's also a lot of discussion in the packet about the, the subdivision staging policy issues, uh, but I, I think uh, I'll defer on that in, in case people have specific questions on that. And I think the best thing we can do now is have a have a good discussion on the non-recommended reductions and where the council feels it wants to be going into CIP reconciliation. And I'll turn it back over to uh, Committee Chair Rice. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Levchenko. And again, I can't thank you enough for this very in-depth view uh, in terms of some of the puts and takes where we are in your analysis up to this point. Uh, as Ms. Beck stated as well, it's very hard uh, to be able to predict uh, what the future is going to be, not only for the support from the state, but then also whether or not some of that will be pulled back. I think that the governor statutorily has until this week to actually uh, veto any bills or else they automatically become law. I think I'm right on in terms of my timing. It's either this week or next week, but I'm pretty sure that when I calculated it was this week. Uh, that he'd need to actually either sign a uh, veto or just let the bills enact by themselves without his signature. Um, so we'll know something very soon when it comes to uh, more finality uh, within the next, you know, uh, week. Uh, so from that perspective, uh, we're pretty close in terms of being able to get a finer point in terms of what our number uh, should be. 
Now that again, doesn't uh, say anything about what happens if folks decide to do a special session and start pulling money back. Who knows what that entails, but that could change anyway, even from what we have right now. So um, while we need to be cognizant of that, it's really hard to predict or to prepare for something like that, not knowing what those things may be. I'll just start off, Mr. President, and then turn it over to my colleagues by highlighting a few things that I see uh, as an individual council member and also as chair of the education committee uh, that, that I think that we need to take a look at. And then certainly we'll defer to my colleagues because this is now a council decision, not just an education and culture decision. I would say that I certainly understand the North, Northwood and Woodward uh, uh, delays being uh, uh, rescinded uh, from that perspective. There's certainly a lot that's on the line here, not just when it comes to uh, the economic impact, but also when it comes to uh, the community impact as well. Uh, folks have been waiting for a very long time and we've told folks over and over again that this is the plan and this is going to uh, happen date certain and we keep pushing it back. And so I think that it's very concerning. I also am very concerned about Crown High School as well. Uh, certainly there as we continue development, uh, it, it becomes a huge issue uh, and certainly one in which uh, we have to worry about our relationship with the city of Gaithersburg uh, and the expectations there as well. So uh, that certainly is there. And then uh, there, there's one more that's on my first tier list and it was council member Navarro, I have to give her credit, who got me thinking about this, but uh, and that's Clarksburg Cluster Elementary School. I will just tell you that the other day when I went over to Clarksburg High School, I actually took the back way uh, and drove uh, from Darnstown to Clarksburg. And I saw the tremendous development uh, that continues to happen. Uh, and it really is one in which with a school that's already at basically 200% capacity, for us to delay that school uh, even by a year is just unconscionable. It's the same thing that we talked about before uh, when we said that um, uh, with the 355 BRT. Uh, and again, I understand the school system's just re reacting to what the county executive put forth and is trying to fit it all in. Uh, so I'm not disparaging them in their decisions at all. But for me, uh, this is one, and it's not just because I represent the area. Let me just tell you, uh, when something's at 200% capacity, that's a huge concern for me. Uh, it's a huge concern when it comes to the operations of that school altogether, when it comes to the expectations and the burden that as we are in the midst of teacher appreciation week, overloads our teachers and our staff that are in the buildings. Uh, this is just re really something that, that I think that we need to add into that first tier list as well. And then when it comes to the second tier, uh, I can certainly say that uh, with um, uh, the Watkins Mill uh, High School uh, Early Childhood Center, it certainly is something that I think we need to take a look at. I would like to see if we could put a pin in that one and come back to it in its own special uh, uh, sort of uh, approach and appropriation in line with what we see that may happen with the Kerwin Commission uh, recommendations and what the governor does with that, whether he vetoes it or whether he allows it to become law, because that's directly tied uh, into that when it comes to early childhood uh, education and early childhood centers. So we certainly want to reap uh, some of the uh, consistency that's there. And then also, I, I, I'm sensitive to Magruder High School because it is a major capital project. And so certainly could see something like that as a second tier uh, for us if we're able to work things like that in. Uh, we have the capacity to do so. I could see something like that. Um, I, I'm sensitive, uh, very sensitive to Bethesda Elementary School as well. Uh, as I know, Councilmember Friedson highlighted uh, in some of his initial remarks, uh, and it is certainly something that is in that same uh, cluster that deals with uh, the puts and takes of what's going on with our uh, Westfield, Montgomery, and everything that's happening there. Uh, so I certainly understand that and see how it could be justified to be on that uh, tier two also. Uh, I will just say that again, when I'm looking at capacity and age, those are the kinds of things that are driving factors for me and not seeing that capacity at the same level is why I wouldn't consider it as a tier one, but would consider it as a possible tier two. Some of the other changes uh, and the recommendations that uh, Mr. Lovchenko has put forth, while again, painful, I uh, certainly understand and agree with, uh, as well as with our board, uh, I agree and understand a lot of the technical adjustments 
all of these projects are projects that we know will make a change in our communities and benefit us. But those are the ones that I'm thinking about right now. I will hold off on motions, Mr. President, uh, until we've had a chance to hear from my colleagues. I know that uh, Mr. Smith, uh, uh, Dr. Smith has, uh, uh, has to jump off for another conference call in a few. So uh, did want to try and give as much time as possible for him to hear the thoughts of all of my colleagues. So I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Council Member Reamer. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, just very quickly, thank you, Dr. Smith, and everyone at MCPS, uh, Shebra, thank you for everything that you're doing for school. I, I have concluded that I, I may not be a science teacher, but um, I can I can help my kid with a to-do list. That's something I know how to do. And, and I think it's going to be interesting. I think some kids are going to learn things that they would never have learned in classrooms that's going to make them better students in the future in terms of managing themselves. Sorry, I had to say that. Um, reading between the lines, so to speak, of um, the staff recommendation here uh, on page uh, seven, top of page seven, um, I, I sort of see a line in between what, you know, in my mind, I don't know if, if staff is alluding to that as a theoretical tier one and tier two or something like that, but, you know, I, I think that the items on the top of that list really do need to be above the line, Clarksburg, Defeef, Crown, Northwood, Woodward, really need to be in there. Um, and I think we gotta move, you know, we gotta move things around to make that happen. Um, and, I, I, and I do especially wanna say the high school strategy here is so important. Crown, Northwood, Woodward also involves W.J. and Blair and Einstein. I mean, it's of uh, Gaither's. It's like so many high schools are impacted by those additional high school seats coming online, and uh, the irrationality of the of the moratorium, which would prevent us from collecting millions and millions of dollars of tax revenue now to spend over the next couple of years because of a one year difference. Uh, you know, six years from now. Uh, is something that we really, we have to change. We've got to change this moratorium policy. It doesn't work. It's counterproductive. Uh, it hurts us. Um, and if we want to have any kind of economic rebound coming out of this, you know, we want to encourage the kind of investment any way that we can rather than prohibiting it as we, as we do now. So we need to get rid of that uh, just straight up. But um, in any event, we've got to get these high school projects funded uh, it's it's going to benefit a demographic demographic bulge that is coming through the schools, and it's going to be hitting high school very soon. Um, and you know we we want to be ahead of that curve. So, as far as the additional projects that are below Woodward on your on your memo, you know if there is a way that we can fit them in based on additional state aid, if we don't need just the additional state aid to get the ones on the top of the line. Um, you know, that, that could be good. I, I also, as Council Member Rice said, I really wanna highlight the Early Education Center. Um, and I, I heard what you said, uh, Mr. Chairman, about a potential, you know, companion strategy for that. I don't know what that could be, but if there's any way to pull that out, uh, I think we ought to. But, um, you know, we, we, we are committed to early education expansion, but facilities is a major dimension of it. And, and when you look back over the last five years, I think without a doubt, the most successful expansion of early education has been what MCPS has done through its own facilities and its own staff. Um, you know, a lot of the expansion into kids who are in low income uh, you know, communities is coming from the expansion of Head Start and the expansion of programs that MCPS administers. And, and unlike other tools in our toolbox, MCPS can just, you know, they can make things happen. Uh, on a very quick timeline. And um, they have been just a key, key partner for us. And so anytime I see MCPS talking about how they could increase their program, I think we ought to get behind that as, as fully as we possibly can uh, in any way that we can. So um, whether that is, we gotta squeeze it in now, or if there's a pull it out, either way, I think the timeline ought to be as aggressive as, as possible uh, to make that happen. So. 
I just want to say again for our recommendation today, I think it should be very clear that, uh, you know, the high school strategies, uh, you know, Crown, Northwood, Woodward, that all has to be in there. Um, Clarksburg to Fief. And then if we have additional resources, you know, maybe there's a, a tier two. Um, and then certainly in that tier two, I would want to see the early education center, uh, especially in any way that's possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith, please. Thank you. I apologize for having to get off. I'll, I'll get off about 10 after 12. I have some longstanding commitments uh, to be on a panel this afternoon, and I can't tell them here at the last minute that I'm going to drop off uh, this this panel about uh, the very issue we're in right now. So um, I wanted to make a couple of points. As you've all indicated, this is these are incredibly complicated. We are all in for all of these projects. That's why they're on the list. That's why we believe in them and move them forward even though there's uh, 300 million dollars sitting there in the first four years that's in question two things the major capital projects i really worry in the conversation that mr lovchenko was leading because there are and i just want to call them out burnt mills south lake nealsville woodland stonegate those projects that are sitting there are not secondary projects those are schools that are over capacity where they have crumbling infrastructure and that really needs to be supported and upgraded as well as uh, Damascus High School, Poolsville High School. So when we talk about these trades, the, I really want us to have all the information on the table and I know that has to keep coming out. The other thing is there's probably not 300 million, no, no, there is not $300 million worth of, of value in those major capital projects that you could just swap out between the two. So that's going to have to be looked at very carefully in this process. Um, and it's my job to advocate for all 200 plus schools every day, all the time. And so I'm not here to advocate one over another, but I am here to highlight that it's not just, these are not simply easy trades. These are going to affect uh, just a lot of different areas of need. And I appreciate you giving me the chance to say that before I drop off and now I'll continue listening to the discussion before 1210 when I'll get off. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Smith. Let me ask before you go, and of course, we're gonna get back to Crown Crown Farm High School and, and other discussions, um, but could you comment please about South Lake Elementary? Um, we've heard from, from many people in the community action in Montgomery and, and many others about the major capital project that's needed there. And um, can you talk about where, what would happen, what, what, what this will all mean for the non-recommended uh, uh, projects, reductions? Absolutely. Um, South Lake is probably one, I think, of the most urgent projects we have in the entire CIP. When you look at the HVAC system and uh, the unfortunate addition that was done decades ago and the way it structures the media center there, the hallways, the classroom, the restrooms, I've been in the school probably 10 or more times in the last four years. It, it is a school that serves a very uh, high number of students with tremendous needs in terms of their poverty and their need for support. And it's just a, a really difficult situation. It absolutely needs to be um, uh, renovated and replaced functionally. Uh, Burnt Mills is the same way, uh, exactly. Was just in that school a few months ago. Again, looking at it, really significant needs. Stonegate uh, over in East County, great need. Nealsville has, has been on the list since I've been here in the county. Uh, and before that, it was on the list. It, it needs uh, significant structural changes. And we're able to build a new school on site while using the current site. It's not dangerous. It's not a, you know, but it just needs tremendous um, upgrades and shifts in the way it's built. And, and I, once schools are open, I encourage everybody to go to Nealsville so you actually can picture it and see it and understand what it needs. Damascus and Poolsville are part of the future of handling the overcrowding of the northern part of the county because we're going to open Seneca Valley and with all three high schools that were in this most recent redistricting uh, will be at or slightly above capacity, no matter how you move the students around. And then Crown, of course, 
has been sitting there and it's we have about uh, six more years in order to keep that property and we must keep the property uh, available to us because I believe it's 20 acres sitting right there that's designated for a school. The community cannot lose the property because of the location and it's free and it's, it belongs to the school system unless we don't start that school in, in the, the CIP. So that's uh, just some of the context of what's going on there, uh, President Katz. Thank you very much, Dr. Smith, and thank you for all that you do. And, and we understand trying to have more than one Zoom meeting at the same time, believe me. Um, Council Member, Vice President Hucker. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Smith, whenever you need to go. Uh, I appreciate all your uh, leadership on this. And uh, thanks to um, uh, Chair Rice and all the members of the ENC committee and, the, and the President Evans uh, and the staff for getting us uh, to this point. We have, um, you know, huge challenges in front of us, and we really have to redouble our efforts to um, find efficiencies in the system because, as Dr. Smith said, these are all good projects, uh, and uh, some are have been waiting longer than others and, and reflect even more acute needs and uh, where we can find efficiencies to, to fund them all, especially in priorities like the Early Learning Center. Um, you know, I, I very much think we need to um, really redouble our efforts to do in our analysis to get us to that point. So uh, is this an appropriate time to ask uh, some questions as well, Mr. President? Doing that? Okay. Fine. Fine. Um, so um, in the spirit of using our resources um, efficiently. Um, one question I have, because it represents sort of a, a risk um, in our planning going forward, um, and forgive me for not being as deep in this uh, as the ENC members are, but according to the packet, MCPS had 20, over 2,500 students um, in, in the 2018 to 19 official enrollment, higher by 1,800 students than the number projected for this year. Um, the projection, I think if my math is right, was only about 760 students um, and we have 2,500. Um, that's a big variance. Um, can can uh, anybody explain the drivers for the variance and where it's, where it's the greatest? Uh, sure, I can. Um, so last year, our enrollment really came in much lower than we expected. And so we didn't really only expect 700 students more this year. We expected it to come in again at last year's level, and we had already accounted for five or 600 last year. So we tried to, does that make sense, to level it out? Mm -hmm. So, and then uh, it dropped all the way to 1,100 last year, down from the 2,500. And this year we expected another 11 or 12, or I think we had 1,500 in there, but it shot back up to 2,600. And so that's what the, it's really just uh, uh, working with the puts and takes of enrollment. So we got more last year than we expected. Excuse me, we got fewer last year than we expected. So we had a, you could say a, an enrollment our, in our uh, surplus in our enrollment projections. We tried to uh, level that out for this year and expect more students and then take into account the extras we got last, or the, the extras we had in the budget from last year and then they it shot back up to its highest level yet. And so it's really just that constantly trying to level it out or smooth it out so that we're never very far off in the number of students we say we have versus the number of students we have. Thank you. Can you comment on what, what any of the drivers are? Are there new developments coming online or new no, um, the, any, the, anything like that? And how much and how closely are you working with our planning staff? Because I've always, I've heard from some of them that they did, I know Mr. Sartori's here, but that they feel like they have data that MCPS doesn't doesn't use maximally to have the most accurate projections. We've worked very closely with the planning staff for the last three years, mm -hmm. very closely with them, and uh, meet regularly with them. And the bulk of the students who were in this big increase this year came in through international admissions in July, August, and September of this year. So we really got a big influx of students uh, from out of state and out of country. And the reason they might have come in to international admissions from another state is because they either had only gone to school there a very short time or, or had actually not gone to school there. And then they enrolled with us. So uh, 
close to 2,000 of them came in through the international admission system last July, August, and September, just less than a year ago. Uh, other than that, um, the enrollment is spread across the system. I mean, we have 80 percent of our schools, or over 80 percent, are actually at or above capacity now, and they just keep going up. Uh, the, certainly, the North County area, the growth there has been tremendous. But we knew that. I mean, they opened Halley Wells, knowing it would be full. They opened Wilson Wims, knowing it would be full. We opened Snowden Farm this year, knowing it would be full. So that that's a part of the expected growth. And so, and we're continuing to add students right now. Thank you. Um, that's helpful. Um, I know we're all interested in savings so we can get as many projects funded as possible. Um, given the backlog of CIP needs and all these good projects, is MCPS considering cost saving approaches to facilities similar to the Monarch Global Academy or other innovative, non traditional facility approaches um, that have been recommended by the IAC, like Monarch has? We have looked at them extensively. Uh, I've been to Monarch myself four or five times. Uh, when I was the state superintendent and uh, chief academic officer at the state. Um, the problem with the Monarch is it is a special school for a special population of students. They get in there by lottery. It was originally built sitting uh, in the middle of three aging elementary, way over capacity elementary schools, and they used a lottery to get in. So everyone thought they won the prize because they were admitted, which relieved those three aging uh, over capacity elementary schools. Um, if you go to the school, it is just so different than a typical Montgomery County school that I think the best strategy to use something like that, and I've talked about this with the Education Culture Committee and the county executive and his staff, would be to create some uh, schools like that in the county that look at special programming. I mean, we looked at the Caldor building a, a year and a half ago, looking at that, we've worked, we've drastically increased our dual enrollment. That's the way we're going to get there if we do it to introduce schools like the Monarch Academy, because I think what you'll hear is no matter who, where you want to cite one of those schools, if you just cite it as a typical comprehensive elementary school or elementary or middle school, what you're going to hear from the community is that doesn't look like the school you just built in that community. Why not? Because it does look drastically different in terms of the amenities, the size and the construction. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. That's helpful. Um, we, um, I know we have, I think, what, roughly 11,000 students in 420 portables. Um, and we're spending more on portables this year um, and about 10,000 empty seats. Has MCPS identified, I was, I was very interested in some of the recommendations in the WXY report and glad you commissioned it. Has is, uh, MCPS identified areas where shifts and boundaries could be used to save capital dollars to use some of our underutilized assets um, rather than building additions in other places nearby? Not yet, but that is one of the primary purposes of that study and uh, we're looking forward to when things get a little back to normal somewhat to be able to complete that study and use that information for adjacent adjacent uh, investigation of, of movements and you see some really interesting uh, patterns already in the first interim study that came out there is some small possibilities out there if we can if we can uh, identify them and make that. They're not gonna be huge game changers, but yes, there is some benefit there in, in the, hopefully in the coming CIP, we can look at some of those. Agreed, yeah, I think there's yeah, a lot of potential. I'm glad, I'm glad you're this far along, and I know, um, you know it doesn't always make everyone happy, but I think it's absolutely what we need to be looking at to optimally use our, um, our limited public resources most efficiently. And last question, Mr. Uh, President. Um, the MCPS current technology modernization budget. I'm. Um, you've you've had a lot on your plate. Uh, we we went out and purchased our two new Chromebooks. You've been able to get them to lots of other families. Uh, the distance learning program has been stood up really quickly. Um, I was. It's a it's a massive undertaking. I know, and one you've been planning for. Um, I was surprised at the onset that there. I found out there were just ten staff on the IT help desk, um, and I was able to get tech support when I needed it, but I have friends at MCPS to call. Not everybody does. Um, I'm a little concerned that that's an area of the budget where you're going to need more resources in the future. 
um, depending, given how much we don't know about what the future looks like and how well we need to be prepared for the, the summer and the fall. Um, and um, I just am flagging that as something that I know it's been a massive challenge, but I, uh, I, I think you might need to be uh, less conservative in your budgeting for the resources on, on IT and tech support. Absolutely agree, Mr. Hucker. And that's something I'm talking with the board members about as we move toward our final operating budget for next year right now is connectivity for students, digital tools for students, and support for students, families, and staff, all yeah. three of those things. And especially, and I don't mean to, I think I said tech about 10 times, but uh, that includes to me training of the staff yes. um, and support for the teachers. I and mean, we've had nice, been nice enough. I'm getting a thumbs up from council member Duwando with your brother, um, I uh, uh, have, we're nice enough to have our teachers call us to uh, make sure that we could log on correctly, um, you know, at eight o'clock at night. And I don't think that's in every teacher's job description. And I think we really need the support staff out there to make sure every family is, uh, is, is linked up the way they need to be. So Absolutely. And if I can just offer two pieces of good news before I sign off here, mm -hmm. check out the Jay Matthews challenge index this past week and check out the US News and World Report uh, on high schools. Uh, I was thrilled to see eight of our high schools in the top 1% of 22,000 high schools in this country. We had uh, another 10 in the top 2% and we had all high schools in Montgomery County in the top 10% of the 22,000 high schools in this country and comparable results under US News and World Report looking at ex excellence and equity. So just wanted to give that good news. Uh, kids are learning and it's going well, but your, your points are very well taken and we're with you on all of those. Congratulations, Dr. Smith and Chebra and uh, and everybody. That's that's all I got. Hope I didn't make you late for your panel, Dr. Smith. Nope, I'm headed out right now. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Council Member Navarro. Thank you so much. I really uh, appreciate this conversation. I don't know how we want to proceed, but I know, um, you know, I, it was sort of my thought process here that uh, perhaps we can move forward with um, making some decisions on what are those uh, particular recommendations that the staff has uh, put forth, but then um, in light of the fact that there will still be some additional analysis of the state aid, uh, et cetera, that we would have, you know, kind of like a tier two approach um, because also, I mean, I am very mindful that this is, you know, every year is, it's a puzzle. And especially when we have to do the sixth year, it's always a very interesting puzzle. Um, but, you know, in the case of Magruder High School, I'll go back to that, the fact that it has the third a uh, highest utilization rate that is being projected and, and we see in the addendum, um, it would be great if it could be considered, um, for example, if uh, the school system, as it goes through the um, CIP process, sometimes there are savings or slippage or something like that, um, that could accelerate a particular project in this case, uh, because it is being recommended for a one year delay um, but, you know, we always say the same thing. Obviously, we have the same issues here. You know, the, uh, the fact that you have a lot of systems and, and programmatic challenges um, and you want to make sure that you don't allow this to continue to go further. So that is something that I would love to see, but not sure how we can proceed, um, Mr. Ch Chairman, in um, kind of separating and putting those things in order. Um, but that is something. And I think that this is a unique um, circumstance because we do now have this uh, potential with the additional state aid, uh, albeit I know that there's still some details that need to be worked out, as has been articulated, but we do have that as an option. Plus, as I said, you know, when you have a CIP of this size, sometimes you are able to um, realize some particular capacity within it and then assign that to a particular project. I would like for us to have some kind of a list that then is considered um, you know, when uh, perhaps these kinds of capacities are um, discovered. Uh, so, so just wanted to say that and, and yes, add my, you know, name to the chorus of um, just overall appreciation. But I do know that we have some issues here with the solutions projects um, that are super important and would like us to, you know, be able to, to move forward with those. Thank you. 
So, Mr. Chairman, also, I just very quickly, I don't know if yeah. I guess after all the remarks, maybe is that how we're going to proceed in terms of? Absolutely. So, so, Mr. President, if I may, um, yes. so from this perspective, what I'd like to do is to propose, because these are instructions to staff, as Mr. Levchenko said, that they then consider how they would work all of these things into the budget. So what I would like to move uh, is that we create, and now that I've heard from a number of my colleagues, uh, that we create a two-tier system, one that has a list of those tier one projects as well as tier two that we then submit to Mr. Levchenko uh, to be able to then try and make those things work. And if in fact they can do the tier ones and then add in the tier twos, that'd be great. So then my colleagues, if you have recommendations, you just highlight if you felt as though it would be a tier one or tier two project. That's how I think we could move forward with this. Uh, Mr. President, I'll turn back to you. You saw, I saw your hand up. Right, well, you do have some other colleagues that were going to speak. So oh, no, 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 I, I, I wasn't cutting them off, but I was just saying that, 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 that's, that that's how, I think when you talk about your particular project, the idea of where you thought it would land in tier one or tier two, and then I think that we can probably from what I'm hearing from folks so far, I can pretty much surmise where everything is going to be at this point, but certainly don't want to cut off my colleagues in their discussion. Yeah, I had just, I had just asked for clarification uh, during my time, and so I appreciate that uh, response. So whenever we get to that point, um, just wanted to make sure this is how we were proceeding. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Albernoz. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Keith. This really was a very uh, well done packet. My first big MCPS CIP, and it was really impressive. And I do want to just acknowledge Board President Evans and your entire team, uh, and obviously all of the MCPS staff who have stepped forward in really significant and profound ways over the last six weeks uh, to really help our families in crisis. And so I just want to start from that place and acknowledging and thanking your hard work and that of faculty and staff as well. Um, I want to also just express my appreciation uh, to the to, to Superintendent Smith uh, for talking specifically about South Lake and Mealsville and some of those other schools. Um, in particular, I, I've had the opportunity to visit all of them numerous times. They track with a lot of our after school and Excel Beyond the Bell programs. And I want to underscore one thing we I don't think we've talked about yet in the net. Schools like South Lake, the whole community school concept is so critically important. And so beyond the everyday academic needs, Monday through Friday during the day, those schools serve as really critical resources and gathering spots for those communities, um, you know, to address food security, to address other very important social services that so much contribute to the academic performance of those students and, and, and shortening that achievement gap. And so I think as we talk about tier one and tier two, uh, taking elements like that into account, I think are important because we should be and are focused on those academic needs. Um, but in addition to that, these school facilities and the families they serve, serve as really important resources. So I, I kind of just wanted to highlight that point and that will go into my thinking uh, in terms of which are the priority schools because there is so much need uh, and it's impossible to get to every project um, and but but we're going to obviously do the best that we can. Um, and I guess the, the, the question that I had, uh, and this was brought up in an earlier session a few weeks ago, but during the recession, we saw a spike in attendance from students that attended alternative schools um, and private schools uh, that, that got into the MCPS system because of the economic challenges facing families. Um, it's tough to project this. It's a moving target, clearly. Um, but I think everybody's anticipating a recession at least as bad, if not worse, than the one we had from 2008 to 2010. Um, what kind of modeling or are those types of concepts taken into account when looking at school crowding uh, in the short term and in the medium term as well? So this, this is Essie. I'll jump in uh, uh, and answer that if that's okay. Um, yes, is the, is the short answer to your question. Certainly, um, this has all happened uh, after the board's CIP was put together, but it is very, very much on our minds. And I think that it's an important part um, going forward as we think about how we reopen schools, as we absolutely will be anticipating um, more, potentially more students 
um, from a variety of sources. In the last recession, we, we did see students, as you say, coming from private schools. We also saw um, students uh, from families that were staying in this area, perhaps um, combining households in this area. And there were a number of pieces like that related to our increase in enrollment as well. And so we absolutely would have that um, on our minds going forward. I think another really important part of that that I just wanna flag for this discussion is that there still are a lot of unknowns around how reopening schools will look. And I say that by way of saying that we're very conscious of feeling um, that we need to be able to use as much of our school spaces as possible in flexible ways um, to ensure that we can maintain social distancing, other guidelines that may be in place as we move forward. And we want that to be, um, again, very present in our decision-making um, as we go forward to ensure that whatever we do, we preserve as much school facility space as possible. Um, I would flag that in relationship to the conversation about Woodward, um, which again, I just would note that our first step uh, with the Woodward project, if we are um, going to maintain it on its current uh, time frame in the approved, would be to tear down the existing building. And so I just, again, would, would sort of raise that as a moment of, of question around um, how we need to be thinking about our school spaces and our available school spaces at this moment in time. If I can throw in one other clarification while I have the floor briefly. Um, the board's recommendation, and I'm, I'm sorry, I wanna be clear, the board did not recommend the non-recommended reductions. Um, when we put forward the non-recommended reductions, we purposely did not include the major capital projects in those reductions, with the exception of Magruder, as Councilman Navarro has highlighted. So I just wanted to sort of be clear that the that the, the school system's response was to prioritize major capital projects, excuse me, exactly for the reasons we're talking about, South Lake, Nielsville, Burnt Mills, Stonegate, those schools that do really bring together a very um, serious capacity need and very serious facility needs together. So we did maintain those schools on the recommended schedule with again, the exception of Magruder, as Councilman Navarro has pointed out, we um, did extend that schedule by one year um, just to make that affordability um, concession. And so I think our reaction to um, restorations, certainly we, hope for and would appreciate additional dollars um, and additional resources if those are available. But we would very strongly be concerned about changing that priority to prioritize other projects over the major capital projects. Our recommendation is very strongly to preserve those major capital projects and to work through other project sequencing in a way that supports the system as a whole. Thank you, Essie. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, I yield back to you, thanks. Thank you very much. Council Member Reamer. Thank you. Um, well, to follow along with the chair's comments, um, it, it seems to me that what we ought to do here is recommend that with certainty, we need to fund the high school projects that are related to SSP. And then we ought to, we could create a tier two, but as a countywide council member, it's very difficult for me to, you know, not vote for a school in Clarksburg or Bethesda or Gaithersburg. Um, and I'm sure others would feel the same or a high school in Gaithersburg. So I would think we ought to create, you know, some recognition that there are schools we also want to fund in addition to, uh, you know, in, in a tier two, but the tier two is likely to be larger than there will be funding available. And then we can seek to get as much funding as possible for that item, that tier two, and then ultimately leave that decision to the Board of Education so that they will make the allocation according to you know, their determination of the most urgent needs. Um, and uh, you know, I think that that would, I, I'm not sure how much more we can do at this moment in any event, because we don't know how much money we have available. Um, but it certainly does seem like all of the projects that we are discussing right now are important projects that we'd like to fund if we can just create the funding. And so when we know how much money is there, we, you know, we can send as much money as we can to the board. And then again, the ultimate decision over one school or over another, you know, should fall to the board. 
Thanks. Oh, I, I had a question about technology funding. The school system is receiving federal funding from the COVID you know, CARES Act and so forth. Is that all operating? Is it is there a technology funding um, in that? I, last I had heard it was 30 plus million dollars just for MCPS. Um, is that to SE? Who can who can help us understand how that money is being uh, thought about at this point? Um, sure. So I can a little bit, although as, as with so many things, there still are some unknown questions. We absolutely, um, as council members have raised, are going to need to be prioritizing uh, technology even more than we have been. And we're very grateful for those additional dollars. I think however they come in, we'd be happy to use them for that purpose. Um, they're, you know, as a funding mechanism, technology, tech, tech mod or the operating budget, either could support that. And I, I don't know that there's a problem with the funding either way, but we absolutely would work work with OMB and uh, council staff uh, to resolve that. So on Thursday, Keith, will we have some inclination, uh, inkling of what the, what how that funding is allocated or is that yet another future reconciliation, uh, you know? Right. Speaking to the uh, tech money? Well, I'm speaking to the fundamentally the federal funding, the 30 plus million that's coming, 39 million, uh, someone is texting me. Um, Sorry, I should look at my phone. Um, that was Andrew. So um, there's a lot of money there. Is, is that for technology? I, I know that we have great tech needs. Uh, we have a lot of needs. When, when are we going to figure out how that money is allocated? Is it in the context of this budget? Or is that a item like other COVID CARES funding that's really a, a future, you know, savings plan, future COVID budget reconciliation, you know, budget New budget, Keith. I think what you just said, the latter. Actually, um, okay. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not assuming any federal-related support um, in our reconciliation going forward. Uh, okay. So those types of elements, uh, just like on the operating side, I guess have to be worked out uh, as we get that information. But uh, I'm not assuming it for our purposes for the CIP reconciliation. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Glass. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, and I want to thank everybody for for the good conversation. Um, and also, uh, I don't know if it's been noted, but it's Teacher Appreciation Week, so a particularly timely conversation. Um, to so thank all the MCPS administrators and staff, Ms. Ms. Evans, and uh, your your board. Uh, and to everybody else who is teaching in this new normal while also trying to manage their own lives. Uh, it's certainly a difficult task, uh, but one I know that we are uh, we are capable of, of doing uh, and have been doing over the next number of weeks. With that said, uh, you know, this is a really good conversation. I appreciate Mr. Luchenko's um, thoughtful analysis one of the things that I'm I'm trying to reconcile as we have this conversation is, you know, specifically related to this uh, crisis that we are in, where we have seen um, the inequities that currently exist in our community, the scars that have been ripped open over uh, many a long time of, of of decisions where some communities have gone without, uh, and those uh, socioeconomic impacts are, are being felt today. Um, they've been felt for a long time, but we're seeing it in all the data with regard to this COVID-19 crisis and the people who are being affected the most. And so uh, I'm keenly sensitive to some of the needs in some of the schools in some of the communities uh, where the needs have been for a while. Uh, and so, so I just want to state that uh, and then the other thing that we have to reconcile, which has been alluded to, uh, is the county's commitment to our regional housing goals. Uh, and if we continue having clusters and communities and moratoria, uh, then we cannot build the housing and the affordable housing that we know we desperately need and that we've committed to. So, so difficult decisions all around. Uh, and I do have one question, uh, and it was, it was asked earlier, but I just want to better understand it. And it's, regard, it's regarding MCPS and the, the current analysis and conversation that's taking place regarding boundaries. 
And while I, I know that no decisions have been made, uh, what I want to understand is if a decision is made or decisions are made, what is the interplay with the decisions that we're making with this CIP? How would those be reconciled if they need to moving forward? Uh, and I know Ms. Evans is here. I don't know if there's somebody else, more uh, technical staff who would be able to explain some of that. I'm, I'm ha this is Essie. I'm happy to, to jump in on that as well, if that's Thank you. okay, Mrs. Evans. Um, so we actually, I feel over the past couple of years of the CIP, I think communities and, and I think council members have seen an increasing number of boundary studies. Um, we, we actually really frequently do um, look at our boundaries as, as a part of the CIP. We also, though, are experiencing so much enrollment pressure and capacity pressure in areas that don't have those immediate adjacencies that we are excited to look for. And so we feel very confident that the CIP priorities that we have put forward um, are not otherwise easily solved. And if and anything that is easily solved, we, we would have put forward in a different way. I do so in that respect. I think there there is an interplay, absolutely, as we go forward to continue to look to, at ways to maximize our facility utilization to the extent possible. The reality, though, is that there still are many areas of the county that are going to require some level of construction um, in order to really accomplish those goals. And again, I would just circle back to our priorities of the major capital projects. Those are ones, and, and I know we keep talking about South Lake, but it, it's been our North Star in this uh, for actually several years now because it really brings together that programmatic impact, the capacity needs, and the facility needs. There's not a different solution to that. And across the board, Clarksburg, for example, is, is one um, where we both are building and maintaining existing capacity and doing boundary studies up there. Uh, and I say that because we just went through our Seneca Valley rewrite um, of the clusters at the high school and middle school levels. So there, I think we are increasingly seeing that kind of movement, even just through our normal course of business with, with boundary studies. The additional lens that we hope to gain from this work is just being able to bring that additional lens to the board in future, um, in future efforts as we look broadly across the system. So I think that the CIP priorities will remain. Um, they may be increasingly informed in terms of solutions from other uh, areas, but the two things will work together going forward. Uh, I, I appreciate that. And your your comments um, about South Lake, uh, I, I think Council Member Albernaz did a beautiful job of explaining the importance and the holistic approach that some of those schools provide the community. And, and I absolutely agree. But, but drilling down a little bit further, there are there are schools that are on the list here where in some of the conversations some of the boundaries might be changed uh, and so if decisions are made here what is that specific interplay with schools that might be funded that in a few months or a year or whatever mcbs decides to do or not do um, how do those decisions get reconciled in real time Sure. So again, as you as you're saying, there are schools here that the construction and the boundaries are going together. One of our um, one of our uh, factors for consideration in boundary studies uh, has been and will continue to be stability of assignment. And so, anything that the board would do looking forward would also want to um, prior have as a priority and as a goal uh, that stability of assignment. When we make these recommendations and bring them forward to the board and then subsequently to the council. Um, we are looking at that at that longer uh, term picture as well to be sure that we're suggesting a boundary that will extend into the future and will carry that benefit with us. So we would envision again that there would be multiple opportunities, but not conflicting opportunities. Okay, um, that helps certainly uh, an important consideration. Uh, I know it's an unknown, but uh, something that we we can't ignore uh, in this decision making process. So I thank you for that further explanation and. Uh, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to turn to Council Member Rice, please. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And so we've had a very robust discussion around this. I think that now I've, I've gotten a feel for where folks are. So I'm going to just summarize and be able to put some motions out there. I will take the privilege uh, as the chair because we did not meet in committee to go ahead and recommend these things. Uh, and I'll do them in, 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 
in order in terms of what I think are easier versus uh, maybe a little bit more of a challenge. Uh, for the first three, I would say that we take on block uh, Crown High School, Northwood High School, and Woodward High School in terms of uh, moving that back on schedule. They all have uh, SSP impact and would move that motion to begin with. Second. It's been moved and uh, seconded by, it was moved by Council Member Rice, seconded by Council Member Navarro. I, I certainly want to say that I agree with everything that was just on this motion. Uh, Crown Farm, I was actually involved with that when I was with the city of Gaithersburg and we received a free school site, a, a high school site. First time in the history of Montgomery County. And I believe it still is the first time in the history of Montgomery County. I don't believe you received an actual free high school site. But the city of Gaithersburg knows that not all land was that was given to the county, to the um, MCPS, was built on. So we never gave it unless they were going to build on it. It's my understanding that the city has not extended the time, though I do believe that they're reasonable people and we could talk to them if it was necessary. I do believe this is very necessary for us to build this high school. So I thank you for the for the uh, motion and I have no speakers. So, yes, sir. I, I'm, yes. I thought you were gonna say that you used to tip cows in Crown Farm or pick beans in Crown Farm or something like that. Well, I, I never did that, but I did know Mr. Crown very well, as a matter of fact. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Um, but if you'd like me to give a history of Crown Farm, I'm happy to do it on another, another day. day. Perhaps. Yeah, go ahead, please. So we have a motion before us all those in favor, please raise your hand. And that is unanimous, not hard to believe. Council Member Rice, please. Thank you very much, Mr. President. So again, on that uh, top list of one year delays, this is not in any order now that we've dispensed of those. Uh, I do move that we add Clarksburg Cluster Elementary School number nine uh, to the list of those also tier ones that we just put for Crown High School, Northwood and Woodward. And so would recommend that we also accelerate that back up to its uh, original schedule and not have the one year delay and would put that forward as a motion. Second. The move by council member Rice, seconded by council member Jawando. I have no speakers. Uh, uh, yes, council member Reamer, you didn't want to have no speakers, go ahead. Okay, so now I need to understand, uh, you know, tier two, tier three, are we, is the chair ultimately going to recommend that this is in, is the chair recommending that this is in tier two effectively? That is that the recommendation of Clarksburg Elementary School that it's in tier one along with the other three that we just voted on. Okay, and, and can I ask, does the chair intend to also move to FIF? Uh, no, there's there's been no conversation about the FIF. Okay, all right. Um, and okay. There's a reason why there's- okay. Yeah, would you like to, yeah, talk to, I mean, I understand, to understand capacity is- Sure, and, and, uh, and that's, and that's, so, so DeFief is designed again to provide some uh, 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 capacity issue, but it doesn't rise to that same level of twice the capacity, 200%. So it's just in priority level in terms of what Dr. Smith uh, and Ms. McGuire had said, they tried to prioritize in terms of where they were, understanding that when you have capacity issues like that, it provides a tremendous challenge. And so being that it's 200%, it rises to another level outside of where a thief would be that's not at that same level. And so that's the sheer reason why it would be a tier one. I'm recommending it would be a tier one versus tier two. It's just based on that, just based on the numbers. Okay, I just wanna say this is gonna get dicey if many council members then also want to move projects into tier one. I don't know if others intend to do that I don't think that's the case based on what I've heard so far. Okay, thank you. Sure. Council Member Friedson. Thanks, just a point of clarification, I appreciate it. Uh, in terms of staff guidance, you know, with, with, with the tiers, are we making a broad uh, determination that the moratorium is the primary objective and overcapacity is an objective as, as well, you know, because there, there, there may be a, a, a circumstance as we move forward where we're gonna have to figure out how to come up with the right math with the puzzle pieces as we refer to them frequently. And if the chair could just, uh, you know, provide some guidance on that, because obviously the, the high school capacity issues have the widest 
uh, implication to the whole county as was discussed earlier, although as I mentioned before, there's obviously significant uh, understanding of the major capacity issues at Clarksburg, and I mentioned the one about Bethesda separately, but I, I recognize that. Absolutely. So, so from that perspective, it certainly is one in which um, you could justify any of these projects being a tier one based on certain criteria, but certainly in the case of the school system, and I don't want to speak for them, uh, but, but certainly we've heard from Dr. Smith and from Ms. McGuire, and in terms of our conversations before, certainly one of the things that was the, the top tier of their priority was uh, the declining uh, condition of a school, as well as the overcapacity of a school. And those were two leading factors that highlighted how they evaluated all of their schools. It's based on the FAP criteria that we now utilize to be able to evaluate when, uh, when schools need to be redone. And so from that perspective, following that same sort of logic uh, is how I anticipate that we'll go along with our evaluative criteria as well. However, again, this is just guidance uh, to staff to try and fit pieces in. Just because something's tier one doesn't mean that if a tier two fits perfectly and a tier one doesn't, that staff would consider the tier two because it fits perfectly. It doesn't guarantee that we'll be able to fund uh, all of the tier one projects. So I just wanna be very clear about that as well. Mr. Levchenko can certainly chime in on that. It's gonna be a stretch for us to just include these first three, let alone anything else that we decided to do beyond that. So from that perspective, I wouldn't uh, count on any kind of a guarantee by it being a tier one or a tier two that it's actually gonna be included in our CIP. So I hope that that gives a little bit of assurance that look, as long as it's one of the ones that we're asking staff to consider, regardless of whether it's tier one or tier two, uh, that certainly that will be something that they try and make work. It will be things that aren't on the tier one or tier two list that we acknowledge uh, based on the school board's recommendation that we say these are non-recommended reductions that we can take to help alleviate the pressure. So I hope that answers your question. Okay. Council member Navarro. Thank you. I actually was trying to uh, just also get some clarity. Um, I know that the staff, you know, worked on particular recommendations. So I had assumed that we would take that and then the sort of tier two conversation would be those additional items um, that we can discuss and see whether they could fit. So j just wanted to just wanted to have that clarification. And I think I heard Council Member Rice uh, describe some of that already. That's right. That's, that's exactly right. The staff's recommendations, just to uh, just to reiterate, the staff's recommendations were those first three projects. So it was the projects that we already voted and approved. That was staff's recommendation. So now what we're doing is building off of the staff's recommendation and building other things in, whether we wanted those to be a tier one, where the staff recommendation for the first three projects are, or if we wanted to add them to the tier two list which is what, uh, based on council member Navarro's uh, great recommendation of another way in which we can incorporate some of these and think about how they'd be added into the budget as well. Okay, because whenever it's um, appropriate, you know, I, I would like for the school system to have the opportunity to um, consider uh, Magruder and the Early Childhood Center as possibilities if there is capacity uh, whether then we're able to come back next year when we're doing the, you know, sort of two-year adjustments. Um, and I don't know where that's going to fit, if it, that's tier two or is that like 2.5? But when we get to that point, I would like to be able to make sure that we identify those and single those out as well. That'll be next. That, that's, that's, that's my next uh, recommendation. Yep. Thank you. Council Member Jawando, did you want to speak? I just wanted to clarify. I seconded the motion. My understanding was that we were putting uh, the, it into tier, the first thing in tier two. That's what I thought I was seconding, just to keep it clean, because I, I think if we should have everything for tier one be tier one and everything else should be in tier two. And then obviously, people, we could they can sort it out. We can sort it out afterwards. Either way is perfectly fine with me. So let's do it that way to make it a little bit cleaner so that all of them are on that same level in terms of ones that we really want staff to look at. It's not gonna be the entire list, uh, I can tell you that, but I know that there are some that are there. So let me do it, make it a little bit easier for everyone, I think, uh, based on what I've heard so far. So I've got Magruder, 
Uh, I've got Bethesda Elementary, I've got Clarksburg, and I've got Watkins Mill Early Childhood. I've got those four. Are there any others? And if anybody could, Mr. Chair, if I could just ask, if there are any others that folks would like to add uh, to that list, and they'd have to give justification as to why, but those are clearly ones that folks have already chimed in and said uh, justify being on the tier two list. And I would sec second that. I mean, you go along with that amendment since it was your there idea. You go. <laughs> So um, hearing that, so so hearing that there's no objections to that, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move that, and Mr. Duando has seconded that. Thank you. So I just ask that, Yeah, sorry, I was just going to ask that. I appreciate that, and I appreciate uh, the friendly suggestion by uh, Councilmember Juwanda. I think the same spirit, but it makes it a little bit clearer that the moratorium capacity, as was the staff recommendation, uh, you know, be, be moved forward, and then the the, the the tier two that makes a lot of sense to me. Could you uh, could the chair just read off the the list again, just so I can make sure I'm following? Absolutely. So the first uh, one is, bear with me one second here. Uh, we've got Clarksburg Cluster Elementary School number nine. We have Magruder High School. We have Bethesda Elementary School and Watkins Mill High School Early Childhood Center. Those are the four projects. And okay. those are all listed at the top of page seven. All the others would not be added into that tier and would be accepted by the County Council as non-recommended reductions. Great, okay, that, that's helpful to me, thank you. I see no other speakers, all those in favor, we have a motion by Council Member Rice, seconded by Council Member Jawando. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And that carries unanimously, thank you. Council Member Rice, was there anything else? Mr. President, that is it. Um, I really just want to thank everyone. And again, Mr. Lepchenko, you've heard the discussion today from us in terms of where the council's priorities are. Obviously, we certainly understand and agree with you that those first three projects that have SSP impacts but are much larger than those, coupled with all of the other recommendations uh, that the school system has put forth in terms of major capital projects that have an impact on our school system remain. Uh, certainly, this will be something that will be a challenge, I know, uh, when it comes to CIP reconciliation. I know that based on our conversations, it's going to be tough to maintain those Tier 1 projects, let alone. But we certainly appreciate your uh, creativity, uh, that you and Dr. Orland are always able to uh, uh, exact out of this process. Uh, and then also understanding that, as Councilmember Navarro and others have stated, uh, when it comes to the additional state aid, Hopefully, there will be some other things that help us uh, in that respect. I will just say that it's an interesting one that I think maybe we need to have us uh, start having a conversation about, which is around what our schools will look like in the future. Uh, if we truly are to have schools that have more of a distance, not students that are as on top of each other as they are currently, that's going to have future impacts as well and will require some additional funding. Uh, whether that come from the federal or state government. And so that'll be something that I make sure I bring up at the National Association of Conferences call, as well as uh, I have a weekly call with our Maryland Association of Counties to start having that conversation. So I've heard that from you, and I think that that's a great uh, thing for us to explore as well. So thank you, Mr. President. Back to you, sir. Thank you very much. Mr. Levchenko, did you have anything else to add? Uh, just wanted to note there, there are a lot of other um, uh, technical recommendations and other non-controversial recommendations in the packet that I'm assuming the council is comfortable with. Um, just wanted to clarify that. And as uh, committee chair Rice mentioned, um, we'll try to provide a little bit more clarity on the uh, fiscal situation on the CIP this Thursday. That's right. That's right. So, so Ms. Lotinko, yes, all of the other technical adjustments are things that we've accepted uh, at, that, that were listed in the packet. And then certainly when we come back to this Thursday, we'll see and we'll have much more information, I think, at that point as well. That, that will help in terms of reconciliation. Mr. Levchenko, do you need a motion for the overall? Ah. So I'd like to move the overall packet, Mr. President, just to be uh, as amended. Second. Friedson. It's been moved by Councilmember Rice, seconded by Councilmember Friedson. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And that is unanimous as well. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Levchenko and Dr. Orland for all your hard work. Thank you to the committee for all their hard work and especially Councilmember Rice for leading us through this today. We are adjourned. Thank you.